Let's look at this nice problem I found in the math magazine today. So our goal is to determine all continuous functions whose domain is the unit interval and codomain is the non-negative real numbers, satisfying two conditions. The first is the limit as x goes to zero from above of e to the one over x times f of x is equal to zero. And the second condition says that f of x is less than or equal to the integral from zero to x of f of t over t squared dt. Okay, cool. So I'd like to start by observing that we can do a change of variables for this first limit to make it look, I don't know if it's a little bit nicer, but it's at least different. And the change of variables that we'll do here is to set u equal to one over x. But of course that means that x is equal to one over u. And if x is going to zero from above, that means that u is going to positive infinity. So here we in fact have the limit as u goes to infinity of e to the u times f of one over u equals zero. Okay, cool. And now I'd like to observe down here, I've got like a similar kind of substitution being hinted at inside of this integral. And that's because notice that the derivative of one over t is negative one over t squared. So that motivates the substitution of let's see, u equals one over t, or likewise, t equals one over u. So if we set t equal to one over u, or u equal to one over t, that means that du is equal to negative dt over t squared. But that's gonna change this integral just a little bit. Notice now the integral goes like this. We have the integral from infinity up to one over x of f of one over u du. With, I guess, a minus sign out front, but let's maybe take advantage of this and use it to switch the bounds of integration. So now we have one over x up to infinity. So let's see what we have here. Let's see if we can maybe uh, summarize these two new things here. So maybe let's do that over here. So let's note that we know that the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the x times f of one over x equals zero. So just to color code my two conditions here, that's our green condition rewritten. And then let's see about our blue condition rewritten. Of course, going from here up to there, I just changed my u's back to x's, which shouldn't be that big of an issue. So next up, what I'll do is observe that if I compose this new inequality by exchanging x with one over x, I have f of one over x is less than or equal to the integral from x up to infinity of, let's see, f of one over t dt, where then I just like put t's back into the integral instead of u's back into the integral. But I believe looking at this, it looks like we're really looking at the function f of one over x instead of the function f of x here. That seems to be a more important version of that function. So I believe that motivates us to name that something. And so let's do that. So let's perhaps set g of x equal to f of one over x. Okay, and now let's observe that g now goes from one to infinity, that's the interval just based off of our change of variables, but the codomain is gonna be the same. We have zero up to infinity. Okay, cool. But now let's rewrite these two conditions in terms of g, which should be pretty straightforward. So our green condition is the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the x times g of x is equal to zero. And then our blue condition is that, let's see, g of x is less than or equal to the integral from x up to infinity of, 
let's see, that's g of t dt. But now I'd like to observe that I can take this object right here and change it a little bit. I'm gonna change this to the integral from infinity to x of g of t dt, and then include a minus sign. But that object, other than the minus sign at least, is in fact maybe an antiderivative, we would say, of g of x. So we could say that this is equal to minus capital G of x, and this is where capital G prime of x is equal to little g of x. So that's writing uh, an antiderivative in terms of a definite integral where one of the bounds is a variable. That's like kind of a standard thing to do. But check it out, we can smush these two things together and get the following. So maybe we'll say that this blue dot up here leads us to the following inequality. We have g prime of x is less than or equal to minus g of x. Okay, nice. In other words, g of x satisfies a following what I'll call differential inequality. So differential inequality. And that differential inequality is y prime is less than or equal to negative y. But observe, that's the same as the differential inequality given by, let's see, y prime plus y is less than or equal to zero. But looking at that thing over there, that y prime is less than or equal to negative y. And then this thing right here, y prime plus y less than or equal to zero motivates us to perhaps multiply by an integrating factor. That would be how we would have solved this type of differential equation. Well, especially if we had a function over here, this would be in the realm of a first order linear differential equation, which you use uh, integrating factors to solve. So if we multiply this by e to the x, we have e to the x times y prime plus e to the x times y is less than or equal to zero. Again, we got e to the x there just in order to turn the left-hand side of this inequality into something that looks like the product rule has occurred. Okay, so now what do we get? So we can maybe undifferentiate this. So now we have the derivative with respect to x of e to the x times y is less than or equal to zero. But what does that mean? So that means that, well, e to the x times g of x also satisfies that setup. Because, well, g to the x satisfies that original differential inequality, which means it, it satisfies the differential inequality that that led to. So in other words, we know the derivative with respect to x of e to the x times this capital G of x is less than or equal to zero. But what does that mean? That means that e to the x times G of x is a non-increasing function. How do we know that? Well, the derivative is always less than or equal to zero. If it's equal to zero, it's constant. If it's less than zero, it's decreasing. Putting those two things together, it's a non-increasing function. And well, this is true for all elements of its domain, which are, well, all real numbers bigger than or equal to one. Okay, so let's see where this leads us. So this is the data we had so far. This is a rewriting of our original conditions in the g of x function. And then this is what we got before. That was our function capital G of x, and we showed that that was non-increasing. But if capital G of X is non-increasing, then negative capital G of X is non-decreasing. But we can build a minus sign into that just by swapping the bounds of integ integration. So let's see, we'll take this and this, and we'll say that now we go from X up to infinity. And instead of saying non-increasing, we'll say non-decreasing, just by that little discussion that we just had. Okay, great. And now let's use the precise definition of the limit 
of this e to the x, g of x approaching zero. Notice that we haven't really used anything about that limit yet. And so this tells us that for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists some real number m, which is bigger than zero, such that if x is bigger than or equal to m, uh, g of x times e to the x is less than epsilon. Well, I guess it's got to be obviously bigger than or equal to zero just by the range of all of these or the codomain of all of these. Okay, great. But now let's note the following. So if x is bigger than or equal to m, we have the following kind of nice calculation. So e to the x times g of x is less than or equal to, now we're gonna use this inequality right here, but in fact, what I'll do is I'll swap the bounds of integration with the minus sign, so we'll have e to the x, the integral from x up to infinity of g of t dt, which in turn is gonna be less than e to the x times the integral from x to infinity of, let's see, epsilon times e to the minus t dt. Now, how did I get that? Well, I replaced my g of t with the epsilon e to the minus t, but I can do that simply by dividing this inequality by e to the minus x, keep in, keeping in mind that all of the t values inside of that integral are bigger than x, and that x is bigger than or equal to m, that means the t's are bigger than m. Okay, great. But that integral is fairly easy to calculate, and the value of that integral is, well, e to the minus x times epsilon, but the e to the minus x and the e to the x will cancel, giving us epsilon. So let's see what we have. We have the limit of this thing over on the left is approaching zero. So like I said, this thing is approaching zero as x is approaching infinity. But then this thing over here is arbitrarily small. And so since that thing's arbitrarily small, and then this thing on the left-hand side is approaching zero, that means that this thing in the middle is also approaching zero. So we have this object right here is approaching zero. Okay, so let's summarize what we have just for a minute. So we've got this function, which maybe we'll call capital H of X, or maybe we'll recall that it was minus capital G of X, which equals the e to the x times the integral from x to infinity of g of t uh, dt is non-decreasing. So that's one fact that we get from our original thing up there. And then also the limit as x goes to infinity of this minus capital G of x is equal to zero. So we've got a function that's non-decreasing and its limit is zero. But now I claim that means the entire function is equal to zero. And let's see how that might go. Okay, so given some new epsilon bigger than zero, we can find some new m bigger than zero, such that if x is bigger than or equal to m, uh, we have, well, what do we have? We have minus g of x is less than epsilon. Okay, so that's uh, this limit being zero. But now if we take any y, which is less than x, uh, we see that minus g of y is gonna be less than or equal to minus g of x, because this function is non-decreasing, but that's gonna be less than epsilon. So in the end, what we see is that for all t on the interval from one to infinity, which is the domain of this capital G function, we have minus g of t is less than epsilon. But we also know that it's a positive function just by previous calculations. So this thing is always bound between something that's non-negative, I should say, and an arbitrarily small number. But the only thing that can be bound between zero and an arbitrarily small number is zero. So that means that in fact, 
uh, minus g of t is equal to zero. But notice if minus g of t is equal to zero, then that means that g of t is also equal to zero, but g of t was exactly this function right here, or this was our g of x function, which we just showed was equal to zero, but that means that our function over here is also equal to zero. But then if e to the x times g of x is equal to zero, that means that g of x is equal to zero, which means that f of one over x is equal to zero, which means that f of x is equal to zero, which really finishes this problem. So what's the answer to this question over here? All functions satisfying these rules? Well, it's only the function that's identically zero.